since the storm, it seems like everybody just moved on. In America, especially during disaster, black children are not even a thought. Have you ever, like, talked about this before? No, I haven't. Why are you that? I don't know. Why not really, didn't really ask me. Since the storm, it seems like everybody just moved on. In America, especially during disaster, black children are not even a thought. Have you ever like talked about this before? No, I haven't. Why are you that? I don't know. Nobody not really, didn't really ask me. Hurricane Katrina caused one of the biggest disbursements of black people in history. After losing so much, why wouldn't anyone ask if we were okay? Nobody ever asked the children how they were doing. So I am. Katrina babies, take one. one can explain, or can Friday, I was at school walking the hallways with my friends. By Monday, I was on top of fucking roof. Everything you consider as part of who you are was reduced to a trash bag. Am I gonna die? I don't know. I just was like, I'm not supposed to be here. Welcome to another edition of the National Newspaper Publicists Association's Let It Be Known. 16 years after Hurricane Katrina devastated New Orleans, an entire generation still grapples with the lifelong impact of having their childhood redefined by tragedy. New Orleans filmmaker Edward Buckles Jr., who was 13 years old during Katrina and its initial aftermath, spent seven years documenting the stories of his peers who survived the storm as children. Katrina Babies, a new HBO film that debuts on Wednesday, August 24th, details the close-knit families and vibrant communities of New Orleans whose lives were uprooted by the 2005 disaster. These American children who were airlifted out of the rising waters, evacuated from their homes to refugee-like centers, or placed in makeshift temporary living situations have been neglected. As families were tasked with reintegrating into new communities, having experienced loss, displacement, and lack of support from government officials, the children were left to process their trauma in a wounded, fractured city. Edward Buckles raises his camera to elevate the voices of his city, utilizing confessional style footage, home movies, animation, and harrowing archival footage and candid interviews with Katrina survivors. He unearths a reservoir of grief and suppressed emotion. Well, joining us is the man who brought these incredible stories to life on HBO, Edward Buckles Jr. Good morning, Edward. Good morning, good morning. Thank you for that intro and I thank you for having me. Well, thank you for being here and thank you for this very, very important uh, film. Often we think of uh, films, documentaries, movies, just for entertainment purposes, but this, goes well beyond that. Uh, yep. You were just 12 years old when Katrina hit, but I read somewhere that one of the main reasons you decided to do the film is that no one ever asked the children who were in the disaster how they were doing. Can you speak to that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, so 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 I was I was 13 years old during the storm and and you know it's it's interesting. Um <clears throat> when I first went into making this project, uh, I didn't know that no one had ever asked the uh, children what happened. Uh, I knew that no one ever asked me. And it wasn't until I began to interview my peers. And I, I remember specifically when I interviewed Maisha, who, who's in the film, and she's the first person in the film to actually say, wait, no one ever asked me this question. And, you know, she's the first person to actually start crying in the project. Well, that's exactly how it happened in real life. You know, um, I was interviewing her and, you know, I had no clue that no one had ever asked her. And then, you know, um, she breaks down and cries. And then I asked her, I was like, yo, is this your first time, you know, speaking about this? And like, she was like, yes. I, I, and then I asked why. She said, because no one ever asked me. And that was the moment where this journey became even more validated for me um, because I, I just couldn't believe that I wasn't alone in that, in that narrative of never being asked about something so horrible. Yeah. Wow. And, and yeah, you have spoken and
and sadness that you and others were experiencing. In fact, you were labeled criminals. So yeah. how were you able to compartmentalize all of that and even survive, let alone document this disaster? Yeah. Um, now, that was a big reason that I started to make this project. Um, growing up in a post Katrina in New Orleans, um, you know, the it, 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 it life changed for us as a whole. But for children, it really changed drastically. Personally speaking, I believe that, you know, the violence changed a lot, um, you know, younger people got more got more access to our things that we would never have access to you know like before the storm that that all got us in trouble and you know we were being called bad instead of being called sad right and you know um i think that once i grew up and you know just 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 like observing all of this and like once i got exposed into the um to the arts and you know uh, I went to Dillard University and I studied theater at the uh, Anthony Bean Community Theater. And, you know, once I once I got exposed to the arts and black storytelling, you know, I took a documentary class and, you know, this was just one of the topics. It was a no brainer for me. I was like, I have to figure this out, you know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was really when Tina called me, my cousin Tina, who's in the film, and she told me that, you know, one day, you know, I'm going I'm to I'm let you make a movie about my life. And I was like, OK. What happened? And then she tells me about Katrina and what she and my cousins, her four children went through. And that's when I that's when I began to draw para, uh, parallels. I was like, wait, so if a kid is locked, locked in an attic, right? If a kid thinks that he or she is going to die, what does that do? And like, I wonder if there are parallels between the behavior problems that we are experiencing and how we are um, showing our trauma and Hurricane Katrina. So that's really what I wanted to find out. What, how does Katrina have an impact on how we are living life now? Yeah, obviously the trauma was so bad. Um, we, we who didn't experience it probably can't even imagine the trauma, but you spoke of going uh, to class, taking courses, um, filmmaking and things of that nature. Was that your therapy? Because I, yeah. I would imagine that so many did not get therapy of any kind. Yeah, um, that was a big thing for me. Um, you know, um, therapy and mental health and wellness, that was not something, you know, that was common, at least in my neighborhood and a, a lot of my peers' neighborhoods. A, you know, a, a lot of the subjects in this film, they didn't really have access to therapy and, like, you know, mental health or the information to know how to, you know, seek that out. So uh, that wasn't always, like, an outlet or, like, a option or, or a go-to option for us. So during the storm at 13 years old, football was my coping mechanism. You know, um, as soon as I got to my new um, uh, uh, city, I wound up joining the uh, football team. But then once I grew up, uh, I got exposed to uh, theater um, because my cousin Anthony Bean, he ran a local theater. So I joined that theater and like I just learned about black storytelling and, and I learned how healing, telling stories, like specifically your stories um, is. And I kind of just carried that with me and like, you know, that on top of being an observer of what, what was happening in my community, you know, yes, it definitely became healing. Yeah, I, you know, we, I certainly am looking forward to seeing the film, but, um, I, and I'm sure this um, will be answered in the film, but what did you witness among your peers that perhaps will always stay with you? Um, I think that, one thing that would definitely stay stay with me is the the incredible strength that they carry while while telling these stories um you know what i learned with this project because again i i didn't go into this project expecting to be healed i didn't go go into this project even seeking to be healed right i i didn't know that it was possible i didn't know that simply telling your story was possible but what i learned from from my peers and like what they helped me do um was to trust my voice and 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 like you know own my narrative so just some background background and like you know behind the scenes information it took me seven years to make this film right and although i am all like you know i i am all throughout the film right now i i didn't get into the film until year six right mm -hmm. and that was because the of the uh incredible strength and like like and you know the right side of resilience of the uh, subjects. And that was something that, you know, I took from them. They gave me the courage to want to share my own story because I heard them share theirs. Yeah, uh, Edward, uh, we're talking to Edward Buckles Jr. Uh, Katrina Babies is the film, HBO debuts uh, that film.
coming up uh, is a must see. Uh, takes us back to that horrible, horrible uh, disaster, Hurricane uh, Katrina. Uh, Edward, um, I understand that one one of the points you tried to make, which is uh, that the media and society as a whole uh, speak as if Katrina, or at least the story of Katrina, is finished, that it's old. Yeah. Explain why this isn't a finished or an old story. You know, that that specific um, dynamic right there was something else that fueled me to really want to get this story told. Every August, every August um, during, you know, starting at the uh, 23rd, um, all the way up until the 29th, uh, there's these hurricane special, well, Hurricane Katrina specials, uh, you know, um, 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 acknowledging the anniversary. And, you know, year after year after year, I would, you know, gradually see that the uh, city was uh, being labeled as rebuilt or the uh, city was being labeled as coming back just because business was coming back. And just because, you know, tourism and, you know, um, um, all, all of these different um, economical um, um, factors were coming back. Right. And, you know, I, I would always just say, you know, how is New Orleans rebuilt if the uh, children aren't right? How is New Orleans built rebuilt if the uh, people aren't right? So when I first started, you know, you know, to make this film, I would always hear, you know, oh, we've heard all of the Katrina stories. We've heard, you know, um, 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 uh, or, or like even last night, you know, like somebody told me, you know what? I don't want to watch any more, you know, Hurricane Katrina documentaries. And I... I understand that, you know, it, like I, 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 I understand where that comes from, but I don't think that we can deem Hurricane Katrina as Hurricane Katrina um, stories as over if no one ever spoke to the kids. Right. Like we are a big part of that. We are the future of that. Right. You know, we were we were impacted at a very young age and, and like our trauma and like our, you know, our true impact didn't even really surface yet. So, you know, we can't stop talking about Hurricane Katrina if children are still well ch people who were children at the time are still learning how they were impacted and how they are feeling yeah you know we always say edward children are the future uh, you know you have to pay attention to the children but it seems that we live in a time where children are totally overlooked um you are bringing out those stories uh, why why was it and why is it until now, until Katrina babies, uh, that the, the documentary you're doing, why do you believe that children have been ignored in this disaster, in this trauma? Well, you know, some, something that like I learned is that, you know, children are, children are just ignored. Like, you know, like anyway, you know, children are ignored um, during, specifically during, you know, during like disasters, children are ignored because, you know, they are a afterthought, right? And because, you know, everybody's scrambling, trying to get everything together, which is understandable if we're talking about it from like a family perspective or, you know, a, 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 a tribe, you know, perspective. So when I say why nobody asks us, I'm not talking about my parents, right? I'm not talking right, about, right. yeah, I'm not talking about, you know, my tribe, right? But I think that if we are talking about it from a government level and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and if we want to get into why we are neglected and while we are not thought about, you know, in those moments of disaster, I can only assume that it's the lack of care and empathy for black black bodies and and and, and our black people, right? You know, uh, I think that to have us in the streets, you know, to have us in the attics, you know, to have us, you know, dead on like dead on the streets in two thousand five for days. I mean, I, I can only assume, you know. I pray to God I'm wrong. You know, I, I I pray to God that somebody proves me wrong. But what I saw at 13 really shaped my view on how I am viewed and what my life means to this country, you know? Yeah. And, and you, you talk about what you saw, um, again, from afar, we saw images that are still um, etched in our minds. Um, the the uh, situation at the Superdome there, um, even in that situation, folks were being taken advantage of. Yeah. And, and I'm pretty sure, uh, you know, sticking with the theme here, I'm pretty sure the, the, the young ones, the kids saw some of these things taking place in the midst of such a disaster. Yeah. Talk about that effect. You know, I, I, can, I can, one of, another moment that, that floored me in this process and that like I, I had never even really thought about was when my cousin Quentin said that 
I will never fight for this country. You know, mm -hmm. when he said that I will never fight for this country, I, you know, I can't depend on it. And he, he, he said that right after he said, I was stuck in my attic for three days. You know, they left us in our attic for three days. To me, that ex like that explains and like that that's an example of how that impacts our view and like our trust with this country you know um i think that i think that when you feel like you don't matter to somebody or something especially something as big as a country and like you know as big as a government i think that when you experience that at a young age how do you navigate living in this country after that like you know like he said that he made that decision at you know at 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 11 years old and like wow. that's just one decision so you know i think that when we look at what's happening in new orleans and when we look at all of the violence amongst the youth when we look at you know um 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 just all of the negative stuff that's happening with the youth like fight or flight um ptsd and 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 like you know anxiety that's our impact you know so like i think that instead of just calling these kids bad calling them criminals, saying that they can't act right. I think that we should meet them where they are and like try to figure out how do we fix what was not addressed in 2005? Because until we do that, we can't just keep playing the blame game. Like we can't experience like that level of trauma that at, at, at that age that we had no control over and then just be expected to just move on. And then like once our trauma surfaces and like once we, once we naturally react to that trauma you call us bad you know like help us out you know like don't don't just discipline us help us out you know yeah and 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 you mentioned wow well, quite the um statement like you said your cousin 11 years old at the time making that statement and you're talking about the government but you know you may recall um president george bush at the time george w bush flew over new orleans um yeah. during that disaster that photo of him caused such an outrage nationwide. It should have, right? it, it, I mean, understandably so. And later on, and you know, he admitted that that was just not a good look for him. But um, do you remember that incident? Um, and do your peers, anybody you talk to in your your um, circles there, remember that incident? And is this something that still you still think about today? You know, my like yes yes you know to answer your question yes uh i do remember that 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 very um annoying and um and like in a way validating photo of george bush flying over you know new orleans like passing us right up while we're asking you know for some type of government help and like when i say validating because you know i think that maybe like after day two or like day three we were like yo is is you know is this a race thing you know like are we still out in the streets because like we're black and 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 you know um have you know has the government you know like i guess like forgotten about us whatever or like they don't care about us so when we saw that that was validated right but as a kid yeah. as a kid i can tell you the moment where i really you know i i i, I really begin to like shift in like seeing that what I was experiencing wasn't just a natural disaster, but it was a very unnatural disaster. And like, it was based on resource allocation and race. Right. So that, and like, that was when I heard what Kanye West said about George Bush, which, which, which is, you know, George Bush doesn't care about black people, but also what he said about, you know, when you see a white family, you know, um, 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 like, you know, out getting food, like, like taking food, you say that they're looking for food, but, when you see black people, you say that they're looting, you know, uh, and, 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 and then like what he said about, you know, we always get the slowest help possible, you know, like that was a moment, like that was classic Kanye, <laughs> that was classic Kanye, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, just because like, I was so into, um, into, you know, music and, 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 and like, you know, pop culture, like that was what, you know, and, and, and a hip hop, like that was a moment that I was like, wait, this is deeper than just, you know, yeah. like a random hurricane you know this is actually you know political in a way you know yeah yeah that that picture they say one picture is worth a thousand words that picture was probably worth a few million words right there i'm sure um edward what other main dynamic you believe has been missing from the overall story of uh, katrina yeah um i think that it's so many. Um, I think that I think that another main dynamic that's that's missing is 
what's happening today within New Orleans. So <clears throat> every year during the anniversary, again, we talk about what's being rebuilt. And, you know, globally, we paint it as if New Orleans is being rebuilt, but we don't, but we leave out that New Orleans is not being rebuilt for us. New Orleans is not being rebuilt for those of us who built New Orleans. New Orleans is not being rebuilt for all of those black bodies that you saw in the streets into, you know, in our 2005, all of those people that, that you are saw on their roofs, like it's not being rebuilt for us. It's not being rebuilt for, you know, black people of New Orleans. It's, 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 it's being rebuilt for outsiders. Right. And, you know, you know, outsiders are coming in and taking over our neighborhoods. Um, so I think that that's a piece that's missing because it's like, people see that, oh, like, look at that, like, good for New Orleans, like, good for y'all. They are helping those people that, 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 that were struck, like, you know, that were left, left, you know, out in 2005. And it's like, that's not true. We have so many people that are still displaced. You know, my cousin Tina is still displaced in Shreveport and it's almost seven years after the storm, you know, and we have people who are displaced within New Orleans. So we are being, you know, like basically pushed out of our neighborhoods because we can't afford to live there anymore. Right. You know, we can't afford the 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 uh, uh, grocery stores around there anymore. You know, so we are being pushed out of our neighborhoods and like our neighborhoods are our identity. So once you lose your identity, what does that do specifically as a child? So I think that everything that's happening with the children right now, I'm not justifying it. I'm not saying that it's cool, but 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 I do ask, what did you expect? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you do you see any optimism, any hope of it ever fully recovering, New Orleans ever fully recovering in those uh, respects? Yes, I think that optimism, uh, I think that opti optimism and, you know, belief in my peers and my generation is really what, what keeps me going. You know, I think that just like, you know, um, you know, I, 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 I took it, it, you know, in my hands to make this film, a lot of other young people are, you know, taking it in their hands to bring bring the change that they want to see in the city. And like, I just have to give mad respect to them because we are not hopeless. We are a very hopeful generation and we really want to see our city rebuilt in our way. So we are we are the ones that's rebuilding it. You know, um, my friend uh, Nesby Phipps said something last night that, you know, I want to start using in press. So but I, I'm, I'm always give him credit. But like he said that, you know, New Orleans is our house. So you know, we got to pick up that broom and sweep that floor. We got to wipe that window. You know what I'm saying? We got to, we got to, we got to lift that sofa up and like, you know, you know, get it with the vacuum. And like, that's what we doing, like with our city, you know, it's our home and we are rebuilding it ourselves because like, I think that when you look at it from, from like a, 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 a larger picture, yes, tourism is back. Yes. Business is back. Yes. We are booming, right? Like, you know, every, like festival season is booming, but I think that, it's sad that we are the ones, like black people are the ones who are rebuilding for us. And black people know what I mean by that because, you know, the uh, French quarters is back, but there's still houses in the night ward that still look close to what they look like in uh, 2005. Wow, I'm unreal. Um, Edward, you, you, um, you took, like you said, you took some time to make this film um, er earlier. Um, you know, you talked about some of the, the things you were hearing, even pushback, right? But wh what was the biggest challenge? I mean, now you're at HBO. It's going to be released on HBO. Um, you, you obviously struck a deal with them. Uh, what was the biggest challenge, though? Me too. The biggest challenge, <clears throat> one of the biggest challenges while making this project was like, one of the hardest things about making this film was how true it was, right? Um, so when I'm making this film and when I'm telling these stories and then once I cut the camera off and like I have to go and live that New Orleans experience, right? So like, you know, once somebody is on camera speaking about anxiety, speaking about, you know, what's happening like in the city, once I turn the camera off, I actually have to go live that, you know? So that was one of the toughest things about New Orleans was that, the more valid that this story got was only based on how worse New Orleans was getting, right? So that was a tough thing, you know, to see that this film was being validated, right? It was, it was, it was progressing, it was being made, but it was only because New Orleans was 
New Orleans, specifically for black youth, was getting worse when it comes to education, when it comes to living conditions, when it comes to mental health, when it comes to trauma. And that was one of that was one of the hardest things about this project because like, you know, I made this project because like I wanted, I wanted that to change. But you know, it it just wasn't, right? Mm -hmm. Um another hard thing about making this uh project was just making it at such a young age and you know, having the audacity to take on such a story, take on such a topic, take on such a people, right? Um, you know, that that was hard, you know, to like because like at times I felt like, you know, I had to carry the weight, right? And you know. I got this idea when I was 20. I started I started physically working on this film when I was 23 and I finished and like I finished this film at 30 years old. So I spent all of my 20s working on this film. Like all of my 20s working on this film. So, you know, that 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 weighed a lot, you know, on my 20-year-old self. So, now I'm, you know, just like taking care of myself, you know, and like seeking help of my own. But um mm. I didn't do it in vain and I think that it's going to all, all be worth it. M me right here sitting Sitting here talking to you proves that I didn't do it in vain, you know? Right. And finally, um, Edward, what advice would you give young and aspiring uh, fil filmmakers, of course, particularly uh, filmmakers of color? Yeah, uh, I took a very non non linear path to filmmaking. Um, you know, my father wasn't a filmmaker. My grandfather wasn't a filmmaker. You know, I, I didn't I didn't have. You know, um, you know, anybody close to me showing me the ropes when I first started. Um, so. You know, I just want to encourage people that black people specifically that 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 have to take nine linear paths to filmmaking and like anything. It's like you do belong there. You are supposed to be there and also use what you have and use who you have. You don't need you don't need the the the, the most expensive camera. You don't need the biggest budgets. You don't like, you know, I didn't really I didn't have a budget for this during the first six years of making this project. I didn't get get a budget until the edit. Right. So like you don't need all of the budgets, like lead with story. And like most of us, we have great stories like lead with story. Trust your story. Trust your vision. Trust your style and work across. Don't always try to work up. Right. Work with who you have and what you have. Katrina Babies, a new HBO film from this man right here. Edward Buckles Jr. debuts Wednesday, <laughs> August 24th on HBO. Check it out. Uh, Edward, we really, really appreciate you taking out the time uh, this morning to join us on uh, the Black Press of America's flagship show. Let it be known. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for having me. I truly appreciate y'all. All right.